I asked the question yesterday, what is a disciple? And I asked you to talk to each other. And when we, you know, and then I begin to explain to you uh, how I feel, how I believe, is I say that I, my name is Ng Mun Heng, is still the same person, whether you want what title you put on, but when you put on Jesus, then you become a disciple. Then the song that we sang was so clear that we asked Holy Spirit to come. We want to see Him face to face. We want to worship Him, we want to be with Him. So if the Holy Spirit is with us, you know, in the Old Testament they called Yahweh, God, to be with us. And in the New Testament they say Jesus to be with us. Today we say the Holy Spirit be with us. It's all the same thing because they are three in one. And if the Holy Spirit is in us, uh, then we should be disciples. Now the question is why are we still not disciples? Or are we half-hearted disciples or not disciples to the full length? So the word intentional is very important. And the book that I gave to the DE is actually the book put there intentional. We deliberately want the word intentional because nothing will happen if you have no intention. Even though you know about it. If you have no intention to eat certain food, then it will not happen because no intention. But unless it is intentional, you will go all the way up. Let me tell you this story. Uh, I, this story, I developed this story long, long time ago. It was, it happened to me, it's a real issue, the real life story it happened to me. When I went to, became a bishop, I moved from Ipo to KL. And I moved to KL, I stayed in the old Rumah Bishop. When the church decided to sell the Rumah Bishop, the place, because it's too old, and we thought of selling rather than rebuilding it. Then I was moved temporarily to a place in PJ. And in that place that I was at a corner house, it has a very nice uh, mango tree. It's so beautiful, so nice. And the owner says, please look after my mango tree. He says, this is a very good mango. So I stayed there and waited. Then the mango came and I ate, tasted it. It was so juicy, so nice. Better than any mango that I tried, either it's an Indian mango or Thai mango. So nice, it's long, long big, round like. So it puts about a hundred of them. So I give to my neighbors, give to my priests, and give to so many. Everybody enjoy the mango. And every year come, they will ask, any more mango? I give to them. And I cannot finish so many. So when I got busy as a bishop, I, I didn't look up to the mango tree anymore. The fruit ripened and dropped. When it dropped, I didn't go and pick it up and clean it. So insect began to infest it and then flew up and attack the fruit up there. That's why you now white people in the mango plantation, they have cleared all the fruit that drop and leaves and they use the leaves and smoke the tree so that there's no insect coming. So I didn't do that. So it happened. Then one year I cut open the green mango. I saw all the worms inside. Ah, and I tried another one. I tried so many. So I don't know what to do with it. Too late, it's already infested. So I thought I waited for a year and maybe smoke it, but it's already infested. So I did not give to anyone. So everybody asks, where is the mango? No more. I did not give to them. So today I went back to the place the, uh, last year and they say the mango tree they chop off really because too old and uh, the fruit is not nice. Now the question is, I ask, always ask this question, what is the fruit of a mango tree? Everybody tells me the answer, mangoes. It is partly right and partly wrong. It's right, it's, yes, it's mangoes, but it's wrong in the sense that the fruit of the mango tree, you take one mango, is another mango tree. You see the mango, there is a potential of life for another tree. I give to everybody they eat. We are consumers, but no one is intentional 
to plan. So I asked another question. What's the fruit of the mango tree? You say mango tree is partly right, partly wrong. Right in the sense that yes, the mango has a potential of life, but the actual answer is the fruit of the mango tree is a plantation of mango trees. Because one tree will bear thousands of fruit if every seed we plant, it will be a plantation. But no intentionality. When there is no intentionality, nothing will happen. Same thing today. We can listen to a lot of talks and a lot of go through a lot of courses, but no intentionality, the discipleship will not take place. Because you must be intentional to do it. That's all intentional discipleship. We move on to the slide, second slide. I'm sure you have. If you don't have it, you can grab one paper again. Uh, yeah, the next one. Session two, next slide. Uh, next slide. Now the I, I ask these few questions. Discipleship how and when? Is discipleship a private or a public affair? Is a private affair or a public affair? Take one minute, talk to each other. Is it a private affair or a public affair? Just talk to your neighbor. One minute, talk to your neighbor. Is it a private affair or a public affair? Private why? Public why? <laughs> Give more reasons. La. Don't just say yes or no. La. <laughs> If you finish that, then you yeah, ask, 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 talk to the next question and say, is it whose responsibility? <laughs> Discipleship. Thank you very much, and I believe we begin now. We are talking about either it's private or a public affair. It is both answer, yes. It's both private and both public. If you talk about Jesus and his disciple, it's one to one, very private. But if you talk in the New Testament to Paul and the church, it's a public. All the pastors, all the elders, all the presbyters, the Episcopal or the or they are one to one, one to a few. That's become a very public affair. When it is public affair, then whose responsibility? Now there are a few answers to this. First responsibility is Jesus Christ, because Jesus was intentional. He says, "Go make disciples." I Jesus spoke to that group of disciples. When on the when he ascended. So he says, speaks, uh, it was said in Matthew that he was in Galilee. They all gathered and then Jesus was ascending. Uh, but you go to look, it is in uh, Mount of Olives, in the Mount of Ascension. So whichever version you, you, you receive. But it says, the Great Commission said, go and make disciples. Now Jesus is speaking to the disciples. At that time, the disciples, you can assume the disciples is 120, maybe the upper room, the 120. You know, or you can assume that there are 500. First Corinthians talks about 500, or you can talk about you know in between, uh, or less or more. Never mind. But Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Of course, not only the apostles, but the rest are he called them disciples. They walk with him. They stay with him. So Jesus speaks to the disciples, say, "You go." So he. They have already been with Jesus at least two years or three years. So Jesus said, you go make disciples of all nations, baptize them and teach them. So that dude should not stop. He should go on and on. So if Jesus speaking to them, it's like a private affair. Jesus, you are my disciple. I tell you privately, individually, go make disciples. But if you look at Jesus, 
you treat them as a church, it's a public affair. Go, make disciples. Once you become very public, nobody will take action. Everybody is expecting you, expecting me. You know, you should go, you, 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 you come to pay first. You know, I came to pay last, you know, so. So those, but the, the, the early church thought to themselves, everybody should be a disciple and everybody should go. That's the early church. That's why they were called Christians. But let me, let me put your mindset correctly. When they go, they, they, they say go and make disciples. Actually, somehow the word gospel was not, mean, was not used in that. Uh, Matthew, uh, eight. <clears throat> Matthew 20, it was the gospel was not, 28, was the gospel was not mentioned. So, but somehow the Protestant church after the Catholic high days in the Protestant church, because we emphasize on the word of God and put back the pulpit for the people. So the word of God was so strong. So now when you say, go and make disciples, everybody say, preach the gospel. It is included in the eat, but it is not only preach the gospel. But Jesus said, go make disciples. Make another person like you. That means your whole life, your whole way should be the same. The last night I shared with you, there was that concept that I took in all the students and I want them to see. I want to make you a pastor, a real pastor. I don't want you to see the pastor only on the pulpit, you know, on Sunday. You know, one of the problem of the traditional churches like us, you know, is we have ropes. Those people who have no ropes sitting down there will talk to themselves, not my job, I have no ropes. Only the rope guy, you know, should do the job because they are rope, you know, and then we, we brand them, you know, oh, this one is canon, this one is archdeacon, this one is bishop, and this one is priest, this one is poor, oh, this one is pastor, or oh, rope. It, it, nothing wrong with the rope. But it is the image that reflected. So in the rock, the Protestant church, they remove all these things. They just put a collar, uh, put a coat. And then same thing, I have no collar. Then the people also. Today, they are now a movement to say, let's remove all these things. And I went to England to the church. He says, I asked them, what about ropes in this church? Oh, the ropes go with the sun, as you end, sun. No, when the sun rises, the rope get lesser and lesser. The first service, war, tradition, everything, marching, procession, war, war, everything, all the gears. Second service, they remove the gears and only the kessa and the stove. And the third service, they remove everything, only collar. The fourth service, nothing. I mean, Coachella. <laughs> so they say that the, the dressing move with the sun, the sun go higher, higher the dressing less and less, and, you know, until they become just some on t-shirt or just on a shirt and jeans. They are trying to be contemporary, but some church wants to bind it very well. Whichever way, it is nothing wrong. It's just a tradition, it's a style, but the best way is the how you reach the people. Today, I didn't see anyone wear a coat because our weather doesn't fit it. But if you want to follow a tradition from the West, everybody should wear a coat and every lady should wear a hat. That is their tradition. It works well. But if our tradition, it didn't work well, you work with your tradition, the simplest, the tradition that everyday life, then every day life people can walk in. Otherwise, the guy with no code dare not walk in. So whose responsibility actually is everybody's responsibility? Jesus, he did his responsibility and now he's for us. So he told us the first generation, go. And now the responsibility passed on the first generation and the first generation lead up to the second generation and he tell them, the first generation tell the second generation, you go. So the responsibility passed the buck. It's just like a relay race. I'm running my first race and I pass my bacon to the second race, second guy. So responsibility hand to him and he runs with the best of his life. You know, then he pass on. And so our life is like that. Go on, pass it on. To discipleship is a race. But now it's not four times 100. Maybe 
a million times one hundred. So everybody run, and then you pass on, pass on, pass on, pass on, keep passing on. Now is the role of the church. Now the role of the church is to keep that make sure that these things are passed on. That's the role of the church. The church are only a collection of all the disciples together. One called disciple, many called church. So the church is a collection of all the disciples. So if everybody take a role, intentionally run it, then everybody should run with it. Now I tell you another story. After saying this, then you are very panicked, really. You no, know, because mango tree, you know, it can produce a plantation. Wow, then you think this bishop is talking about a mango tree. So the mango tree, everybody should produce hundreds and thousands of disciples. Huh? You're worried. But sometimes God is very fair. God made, you know, pineapple tree plant. If you know pineapple plant, it only grow one pineapple. The most of that two, but mostly go one pineapple. And after the pineapple, the new shoot will come up, grow another one. So God is so fair that some are mango trees, it really produce a lot of fruits, and some are pineapple, produce one at a time, one once a year. But then don't worry, you say, I didn't produce anyone. But some God produced as rose plant. Rose plant didn't produce any fruit, but produced flowers. The flowers were attracted. So sometimes God is so fair that He made all everybody a mango tree, otherwise you will only mango and nothing else. But He made some are mangoes and some are pineapple and some are uh, rose plant. But you, 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 you expand the rose plant with all other plants. And, or, you know, pineapple, you expand it with you know, all others, like a banana tree. It's only produced one bunch of bananas, that's all. And it, it grows again. The banana tree has died and go, grow again. But the mango tree can be like an apple. Uh, it keeps producing. So, God is so fair. You, we have to go and find out Sometimes we may, we, our discipleship may not re really to produce, bring in a lot of people, but your discipleship is attraction. You can attract and give. You know, attract the bee to come and then lead it to, to fertilize another, another plant. So all these things need to come and fertilize the mango, fertilize the apple, fertilize the rest. So we share together in God's economy. So the role, everyone has a role. The, don't, we, don't you think that you, when you are a rose plant, so I don't need to produce, no. But we still need to produce the flower to attract people, to attract the right kind to come in, so that they will also fertilize the rest of the, the plants, the rest of the fruits, fruit trees. So discipleship is a mandate of heaven. It comes from heaven. Because Jesus mentioned it, and it's so great that we even sing song, we memorize it. Uh, so, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you're teaching them to observe all that I have taught you. So the last word, observe, teach them to observe all that I have taught you. That means the full set of Jesus' discipling should pass on to the first and should pass on to the second. Teach all. You go to the third and tenth and hundred generations still have to teach what Jesus taught you. The same thing that Jesus had taught you. That's discipleship. That's intentional. So if we have intentionality, I believe it will work and the church will grow together. As I say, you don't have to be producing a lot of fruit, but yet you should be attracting and producing your flower, the right kind of things that God has given to you. Some are very good. Some, some pastors are very good in preaching. Some pastors are not good in preaching, but they are very good in visitation. After visiting the, the person, wow, the person feels really uplifted. Some pastor cannot visit. If we see really the guy very depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then you see pasta, how many people? But his skill is not here, his skill is some pasta are very skillful in, elect, in, in administration. Fantastic. I, I, I don't want to be a bishop because as a bishop you need to be an administrator. You have to look after the whole diocese or everything. So I didn't like that. But I, I manage, I'm, I, I, I'm basically an administrator myself, but I don't like it. I like to go to the grassroots. But they put me there. I had to spend a lot of time on administration. And, and some pastors are very good reconciler. We are able to reconcile both sides together. And some cannot reconcile. Some you don't put him there, you put him there. Actually, two groups become four groups. <laughs> <laughs> so you must recognize your gift. So when you recognize your gift, then you put your emphasis on the gift that you have. Then you build up that side. Just the same thing is that some are very good in cooking curry and some are very good in making pastry. The baking pastry may not be good in cooking curry, they may be good in both. So then you see where your strengths are and concentrate on that. So if you take discipleship, it will be the strategy of the world. Now the world, we, we are praised, we are thankful. Let me, let me step back. 200 years ago, this part of the world was no one believed in Jesus Christ. No church. So the missionary those days, in the West, they came. Not all the missionaries are good, but a lot of them are good. So they came. They, did, they came here, they did, little did they know what is this world like here. They don't know our food. They don't know our weather. They don't know there is storm. They don't know there is, you know, weather is so bad in time times. They don't know anything. They just came, trusting God, and they came. And the worst thing is they don't even know our mosquitoes. So many died of mosquitoes. So they don't even know and they came. So they came is they really fulfilled the first part, go. They really fulfilled the first part. And of course some may be regretted and some didn't and some did great job and built up our churches and those great jobs, we remember them. Some died, we don't even know who they are and they are in a grave somewhere. So, but we want to thank God that these are great leaders, missionaries, they, they, they took up the first road to go, literally go, not sure how the world is like, they go. And when they go, they, they knew that they had to make disciples, but when they came, nobody believed in Jesus Christ. And they came to this part of the world and they realized that there's no school. They don't even know how to read and write. How to make disciples, how to give them the Bible. So the people in the early days translated the Bible in their language. Our Malay Bible, the Malay Bible, in this part of the world, you'll be surprised. King James was translated and became King James in 1611. The Malay Bible was translated in 1612. 400 years ago. It's already here. And the Malay Bible have many versions. Now I'm the Bible Society President of Malaysia. So I went through the whole thing and there are many versions of the Malay Bible. Many versions, both Catholics and Protestants, many versions. More versions than any of the Chinese Bible. The Chinese Bible only started, you know, very late, 100 years ago, the Union Bible. Before then, maybe the Morrison Bible, which nobody reads because very hard to read. Uh, it's not very fluent in writing. But the Malay Bible was already there. Tell me why 400 years ago, 1612, who will ever think that there should be a Malay Bible and a Malay should be uh, to, to become Christians here? So even they give them a Bible, they don't have no school. I, I know that the Bible Society, we have to, every time we, tr we produce a Bible, we have to produce a dictionary for them so that they will able to follow and learn. Then we have to engage with them. Otherwise, they would have the Bible and nobody for them. So it's why the Malay Bible, so many years, in the 1600s, we have the Malay Bible translated, in the 17th, translated, 18th, translated, 19th, translated. In the 20th, we translated again our Brita Bible. 
in the third and twenty first century, we produce again now the AVB version. We talk very good, but actually they have already got so many. Why are they not picking up? Because nobody engage them to use those money. Okay, I'm not going to speak of that, but I want to say the strategy. The missionary came to do that, and because they go and they want to make disciples, the one who make disciples, they say must baptize and teach. Hey, kalau tak boleh lah, because no school. So that's why they bring school. Now we have so many schools, missionary schools in the whole country. You know, plus the Catholics and the non-Catholics and all of us, and add together, we have 400 over mission schools. It was the the highest number in the British days. Of course, after we become independent, you know, we hardly produce any school on our own. Even we produce now is trickling. Here you have mission school one, two, three, very good. But by other places, West Malaysia no more school. We only close school. We don't have open. We open, don't open schools. Secondly, they realize that these people not only they need education, no money. So they created social agency to help the orphan, to help the poor. And to find money to send the children to study, and those days 100 years ago, nobody believed ladies should go to school, especially our community, and the church began to open ladies schools for the women, for the ladies. 100 years ago, and there was a big war. I read some of the articles. The big war, the war to say that we should not go send the ladies to the schools. They are brainwashing them and want them to marry the white people. So there were articles of this kind. But they already had foresight. So they saw they need school, so they fund them. I saw in St. Mary's School in KL, the record was showing that how the principal of Orang Putih went and raised funds to knock at the door of all the Chinese homes and I said, send your daughters. He said, no money, we never mind, we will find money for them. Then they, after they realized that they are also having a big problem of health issue, no hospital to go. So they start clinics all over. And today we close down all the clinics. Because why? We got the government hospital. So now we, now today we depend on the private hospitals. But of course there is facilities. Before that there was no, so they will have clinics all over, produce clinics. Then when you see, these are the strategy they go. I call them the three, four missionary method. And this three, four missionary method is education, medical, and social. Everywhere they go in Africa, in Latin America, it goes everywhere in Australia, in New Zealand, everywhere you will see the medical facilities, the educational facilities, and the social facilities. The church is very advanced in all these areas. We need to develop this strategy, and that's called discipleship, not only the word. So when you have the school, then they will be able to read the Bible one day and they can understand and decide for themselves why they should believe or not. So this discipleship is for all overwhelming. I want to say, share with you that if you can see this today, you there are so many things else we can do. And in KL, KL alone, there are more than 70 uh, migrant schools, more than 70 migrant schools. All these are migrants to come over and either with the document with no documents, whatever. Then the people ask, why start migrant school? To start for our own children? But the same thing is like a mission. Their mission, we don't go, they come to our field. Now you are in front of us, do or not. And one day God asks you, hey, the migrant come to your doorstep, you know, did you do anything? Oh, I'm waiting to be sent. To Myanmar. He said, No, Myanmar come here already. <laughs> I said to Nepal, hey, Nepal come here already. He said to Bangladesh, Bangladesh come here already. Uh, here we got a lot of Filipinos and Indonesians. They sent here already. Like it or not, I'm not I'm not a guy who really support all this idea of the project I see thing. But they are already here. What do we do? And I, don't, I think they, they, they are planning not to go back. So one of you, 
you like it or not, maybe one day they will be our government. One of them will be a prime minister. Who knows? Have you ever imagined that Obama can be a prime minister, uh, be the president of America, who was supposed to be the generations who were supposed to be migrating there? After some time, let's see how God sees the world evangelization. Discipleship is to engage them and to form them and to put in the end of the day, they have no question of education, they have no question of medical, they have no question of social, and they should ask themselves, how should God live with me? And how should I engage with God? So the public, and the next, next slide, uh, the world tells us that religion is a private matter. That's why now the secular world tries to keep everything out. Private matter, private matter, nothing, you cannot do anything. But Malaysia still want to control everything. Uh, but I want to say to you both answers. The Old Testament is everybody's affair. The children learn from the parents, learn from the rabbi, and learn from the community leaders, learn from the priests and prophets and the Levites, and learn. Old Testament is a community affair. The New Testament, the discipleship is everybody's affair. The disciples learn from the apostles, the elders, the priests, the deacons, the teachers, the leaders, and prophets, and pastors, and everybody, and even from the parents. They learn from everybody. That's a community. In Africa, they have a saying, to raise a child, you need a whole kampong, the whole village to raise a child. It's a community affair. But today, the world retreated back to a private affair. This is pre-Christian. A private affair is pre pre-Christian, or pre-Old Testament, this is all private affair. Now, we are retreating back to the old ways. We should go back. Let's share and teach one another and, and, and engage one another. So then whose responsibility is this? In the Old Testament, the responsibility, the next slide, okay? Next slide, okay. The Old Testament, the responsibility falls on the leaders, those who are entrusted with the knowledge of the Word of God. They have to study, and the priests have to study, the prophets have to study, and parents and teachers and the kings, whoever have the knowledge, they, that once, whenever you have the knowledge, you have the responsibility. Today, if you are three-year-old Christian, you have the responsibility because you already know the Bible more than the new guys. You have the responsibility. At least you know how to pick the Bible. You don't know how to pick the Bible, at least you know how to go to the the index, the <laughs> context page, <laughs> you can find. I remember when I became a young Christian, as well as we got Christian, went to the church, the, the pastor was preaching, I don't know where to find the Bible, don't know where, he, he talked about Solomon. Where? Where got Solomon? I look at index, no Solomon. We don't know. He talked about Samson, hey, don't know. You know, then he, he talked about John. John, I thought, oh, I saw John. And then he was, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And then finally he said, you know, then I said, this John, no, 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 no. This John who write the John is not the John that he was mentioning the John. That one is John the Baptist. I said, how, how do you know? So the person who knew had to teach me. So that responsibility is everybody who knows, who have the knowledge. In New Testament, discipleship is everybody's affair. The believer learns from the apostles, the elders, the priests, the deacons, the leaders, the teachers, everybody. And the, you know, it's New Testament, it pours all over everybody. Everybody. Now I want to ask one question. During the early church, 300 years of persecution, they have no Bible. They have no systematic theology set up. Tell me, who has the authority to teach? No seminary. No, no, of all the things that we have, the church that they have, the leader who, who, who share the word, depend on who? Whose authority? Oh, I, I dream of something, then I say something. Early church have nothing, no? But they can still preach, still teach you the right thing. Because they follow the, the great commission, teach what Jesus taught. 
So they go back to what teachers taught. And by the time when, after the early church, they have, they have the gospel, Mark, Luke, and John, all these things. They got so many other gospels and so many, but they're all floating. They are not confined. They don't know which is right or so. So they heard a little bit about the parable of good Samaritan, they taught. They heard about the beatitude, they taught. So they taught what this, this is from Jesus, they taught this. This is from Jesus, they taught this. They just want to check with the apostles, if the apostles are alive. If not alive, they check with the elders. So they did that in a hard way. Today we have the Bible easily, we just refer. And today even easier is good Google. Google. Wow, they come out with it. <laughs> so Mr. Google now, you know, very famous around the whole world, you see more than Jesus Christ. Huh? So today's church, we the responsibility has to fall on the you know the word of God. The word of God now is not only the only who knows the word of God, the lay people also know the word of God. And some of the people, the lay people, have known more of the Word of God because they study uh, and more than the ordained people. Ordained people maybe have so much to do, so much funeral, so much weddings, and so much things to do. So sometimes the preparation may not be enough. But the lay, you, you prepare for them. Then they can, you know, they don't preach regularly, but they teach, they say, once a month or once in three months. They can prepare a better job and they can preach a better way. So they are also leaders in many sense. Full-time, part-time, volunteer, working in the society, everybody has the word of God. That's the responsibility because the responsibility is not only teaching the word of God, is to lift that word of God. To lift that word of God. And sometimes they, you know, we cannot solve the problem, we just have to ask one brother, one sister. They can solve it better. Because they, they went through, they walked through that life and they understood so much about these things. Now what is the role of our church today? I'll quickly run through these very quickly, then I'll show you a little bit of practical things to do. The church became a platform, just like a platform. It's just an opportunity for you to gather, a gathering, a community, an assembly. So the church role is to make sure that the church role covers a wide span. There is a five marks of mission. The Anglican church created this five marks of mission. Doesn't mean that it, it only started with the Anglican. It was in the Bible, but the, over a couple of decades ago, and the people begin to put it together and say, let's do this. Uh, so that we remind ourselves again and again, again and again. So the five marks of mission, first, you know, it, it's just the Great Commission. You know, first mark is evangelism, preach the word of God. Second mark is don't only stop there, it's cycling them, teach them. And third mark is do justice. It means you have to go and do justice. That doesn't, doesn't mean you have to fight with the government, fight with all these things, no. Just, just justice means you can see things that are not right, don't do. See this right and make it right. You know, just like sweeping the dust. Uh, the rubbish. My wife and I, when we moved to after retirement, we will we have a bit more time than before. So we walk around the community, and then we realize that people like to throw rubbish everywhere, especially the mass. Simply throw the mass everywhere on the road. I think some are people better lah. Uh, you keep the mass. Uh. So you, we, the people throw the mass. So we go and take a big plastic, take a tong, go walk around, take, and everybody look at us. You know, we, we pick, pick the rubbish, the, the, the whatever can, whatever uh, packet drink that they do through, through there. So we pick, 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 and then we throw. Then I saw hey, another uh, Punjabi guy. He is also doing it. But he didn't tell me to do. He didn't tell me to do. But he do the other side. We do this side. So, and everybody, even we pick it in front of the door, and the people were watching. Yeah, I don't know what they think now. Like why these two, all people, nothing to do, huh? Picking this. <laughs> we, we want to put right the thing. But sometimes you cannot speak. You do first. Sometimes you cannot speak, but you do first. After doing a while, I, I, I backtrack a little bit. Uh, when I was in uh, a priest, when I was a priest in Ipoh, 
the bakery was was in the church. So the church needs to expand. So we move out to a, to a housing estate. The housing estate in front of us is a field, a green field, where they put more field, people will play football. So every evening, at that time, my children were young. So they either push the trolley or the, the, the pram, or the, the, my son will be cycling. So we just walk around. We walk around. So when they walk around, we just swing our hand. Either one hand put the swing. So when we swing our hand and walk, and I told my wife, let's swing. And the people thought it's exercise, like it's a swing. But in our heart, we say, bless this house, Lord. <laughs> they want God. Either one of them. Bless it. Either God, God, the Islamic words, you know, all got a Hindu come up, uh, bless this house. You know, bless this. They don't know. Then we pass by, we see people, we say, hello. The people usually <laughs> look, hey, who is he? Yeah? They don't know him. You know. Uh, after a while, they say, oh, how, how? Then we don't even know their name. We just say, hey, makan ini ya. So, uh, sip, oh, 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 happy, you know. Just do like that. We just bless them, bless them. Oh, we stay there how many years? 10 years, 15 years? I think 15 years. Huh? So many become Christian. The worst is, the, the best is one of the lady. Every time we say, hello. Hmm. Oh, you, oh. Face like that, no. Husband is an inspector. Hmm. Every time, the husband very good. Hey, hello, hello. Well, wife, hmm. Wow. The whole community, nobody talk to her, no. Hmm. Oh. So we also, that good, huh? And after a couple of years, one day she knocked my door. Oh, I happened to be at home, she knocked my door. Pastor, Pastor! I said, yes, what can I do for you? Please come to my house, I want to remove the idol. Huh? So I went across, la, just eight or ten houses away. So I went across. Yeah. Because she got a lorry already. She already removed everything. You know? She just said, well, I want to remove idol, I want you to pray. I said, why do I ask, why do you remove an idol? Oh, I don't want to pray really to this idol. I want to become Christian. Oh, when? He said, last night. Where? He said, oh, I went to one church. A friend invited to the church and I attended and they, they preached and I accepted Jesus Christ there really. Oh, very good. So I pray and then the, the man removed and throw the thing away. Then I talked to her, I said, very good. And you should go back to your friend's church. No, 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 I don't want to go back to your friend's church. Why? You know, I want to go to your church. <laughs> because my church is very near, uh, just walking. And so, I want to go to your church. I said, why? Oh, I see you are good pastor, la, good man. When you say good man, you know, good pastor. Wow, oh, happy, la, I saw you so much. <laughs> Jumping really inside. <laughs> so, I, I baptized her later on. So, they, a person like this, you know, we didn't do anything. We just said, hello, how are you? Even though, hmm, I said, hello. So, you, you hmm, so I said, hmm. I didn't think back. I think back maybe she won't come and see me. He said, not a good pastor. So, <laughs> good pastor. So, we had to do the Pima. So, to right the wrong, it is not one day. You know, to do justice is not one day. You know, so we have to start from everything that we can see. You know, parking in the wrong place. You know, a lot of people parking on the, the, the handicap slot. We walk a bit farther, further, never mind. You know, after all, you have not reached 10,000 steps anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Park a bit further. So, we we'll help each other, and I think it will work well. And my neighbor, a Malay, like cats. Rare, a lot of cats. And a lot of these cat sheets there, he never go and clean, so smelly, you know, my wife told me. You know, it's next door to us and we have a plant here. Every time you have a plant, oh, the smell very really small. So we told him, oh, Pachi, he never bow. La. So he put plastic, put, but the smell still cross over. So then my wife told me, how are you going to confront him, talk to him? I said, no, la, la. pray for him. Yeah, pray, la. Don't pray, how to pray? I said, bless him now, pray and bless him so that he 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 buy, he get richer, buy a bigger house and remove. <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> pray, he get blessing, then he get a bigger house and he move. Uh, and they pray that the some, some person come uh, and don't break it. Uh. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so the mentality, the whole time change. So you don't get angry with him, go fight him. Oh, you do this, I do that. You know. 
。那么，那什么是什么 ？Four ecology. You to think of the the creation of the world. You know, we we are now saying the climate change, climate change. You know, that's five marks. One of the marks is ecology, and also one of the marks. You know that we need to look after each other, and one of the marks, the last mark, is the you know, is to look after all the people who are who are needful, who are called the least, the lost, and the little. Look after them. So I want I don't want to dwell more on these things because these are all the things that I mentioned at the bottom there: evangelism and mission, and discipleship training. And I add the prophetic and healing ministry that is now very needed. A lot of people need to be guided in worship and praise, in the social and justice, in eco care and recycling ministry. We the church need to start. The people need to follow. Sometimes they take long time to follow, but the church need to start. And we are the church in our own area. Why I say that? The church is like a light. The huge light with all the hundreds of little candles put together, so bright. So when we go back, we a little candle will go back. We go back to our place, and we so dark, and we only one light there. So the church is that center that we we need to shine. By the time when we move, we know that when we come back, we can if we if we are. The light went off. We can come back and get more light, and go. So the church. Until one day you plant a church here, then they have more lights coming in, and then this place will be shining brighter to them. This is one of the reason why you need church plant. When I was in Nepal, when I went there in the eighties, there were fifty churches. I I knew because they registered with the cemetery association. Otherwise, you cannot marry without registered there. By the time I left, twenty years later, it was hundred fifty. This time I went back after my retirement as a bishop. Now three hundred plus churches. I say, why so many? People ask, why so many churches? I say, very simple. If three hundred churches, one church is one hundred people. You need thirty thousand. How big is Ipoh? Nearly a million people. You want three thirty thousand is very little, lah.、Right? Because of the church is not very big, so I say, let's begin. The idea or concept is the light there. When I was doing the village work, and I was struggling whether to plant any church in the village, though my heart wanted to plant, but I had no good reason to explain to my PCC and all the people. Then finally, I realized that we rented a place. And we preach to the neighbor. Oh, very good! They all come. Many people come for us, but nobody want to get baptized. I was so surprised. After three years, nobody want to get baptized. They nice. They like to come to fellowship. They want to cook together. They eat, and they want to listen to the Bible story a lot. And they will say, "Very good. You're very good. You know, you believe or not? I believe, but baptized nobody." Then down the road, there is one house on sale. Was already they call it a haunted haunted house. No, for eight years nobody. So I went there and it was auction. Nobody buy because the whole village says a haunted house. So the the bank auction now, every half a year came down the price, came down the price, came down the price, came down the price. I always watch, <laughs> watch. You know, came down price. So finally came down so low to、uh, houses. Each house got four rooms, got a kitchen, got a lounge, and two houses going for forty thousand ringgit. And I said cannot go for the further lah. So we took the paper, go to the bank, ask. He said cannot go further already lah. We are we are losing money, you know. Uh, so so many years nobody buy. So we first time I went to auction. Wow, pastor also must go to auction. I raise one hand, five hundred dollars. So who is the one hand? So finally, we paid four forty thousand and five hundred dollars. So I got the place. Then I renovated it, make it nicely, and move our church. And the neighbor asked. I invited the neighborhood. No, the neighbor asked. Hey, you are not scared? Didn't hear any sound. No sound. No, not scared. 
I said, not scared today. We all pray and we say hallelujah. We praise the Lord. We pray. Uh, all the ghosts ran next door. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you invite us to go and pray. La. <laughs> you will go for the... <laughs> then after we started uh, in 1996, that place, suddenly the neighbor, the old place, don't want to get baptized, suddenly say, I want to get baptized. I couldn't understand. Of course, she gave her reasons. And not only one, so many families came and now the church is thriving there. Of course, the village is a village. Lah, huh? the, the young people all gone out to away from the village. But then in, the, in that place, then I begin to dawn on me one day. I say, no wonder Joshua says, you have to take possession of the land. You don't take possession of the land. It's not yours. When we take possession of the land, that belongs to you. That's where the light begins to root and shine. No wonder these people suddenly all come just to, to want to believe. And I want to say to you that village, the Methodists has tried, the Gospel Hall has tried, the Ante Pentecostal has tried, so many have tried, but no church succeed. And the Anglican church tried and they don't believe, but they succeed. Yet it's already 97, 97, we started in, after buying that place. Now it's how many years? 25 years ago. And they just keep producing new people there. I want to say to you, there are, this is the discipleship. And you walk with them, stay with them, and grow with them. So the next slide talks about the mandate of heaven. And I quickly just finish. You know that the, the verse is very clear. I put there, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Go, make disciples. And let this be a cycle. The first generation go, make disciples, baptize and teach. Then, just he had really produced a second generation. And the second generation should do the same. Go, make disciples, baptize and teach. Then you go to the third generation and you go on. That's why the missionary came here. That's why the missionary came. And unfortunately, the missionaries, they are the western part of the world that sent missionaries those days. They are not sending any more missionaries. So, they also have facing difficulty because they're not sending. And not sending, they're also stopping this thing. So we will happen the same thing if we don't carry on. Next slide. Now the strategy of the world is that this continuous cycle is first generation to second generation to third generation carry on because Jesus says, and I add the part, Behold, I am with you always. And then I've added the first part, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus said, I have the authority I give to you. Now I have the authority. You do the same thing, and you go there, and you give the authority to the same guy, and he goes on. And then with that authority, you must go back to Luke 10, and that authority, he says, that even the devil scared. When they, the 72 went out, they came back rejoicing. And that authority, they were given, he says, even the devil trembled. The devil trembled. So that's the strategy to go. Now the question asks, what cost? How to do it? What shall we do? Uh, before the question then, come back one step. Huh? So, We'll go back to the slide, over previous slide. Okay. So the people ask, how do we do costs? Actually, there are so many costs yesterday I showed you. There are so many costs in the world. The Salam cost is there. So many costs in the world. And the pastor always asks me, the priest always asks me, Bishop, how do we do? I say, you just grab one cost. Whichever cost that you like. Grab one cost and run with them, and ask them to learn, and run again, and ask them to learn, and run again. And I did that in my church. Those days, when I went to the church, I told you about the basic Christianity thing, I told you, so I want the whole church to understand basic Christianity. So quite a lot of the people re-study again, 
basic Christianity. And I realized that the church, a lot of people are married and they have never gone to premarital class or postmarital class, never. So I redo for the whole church again. But you know, each time uh, a group, a group, a group. I did that because I say if you are non-Christian, you marry, but obviously you don't have. You are married sometimes those early days you don't have a proper marriage course, you go through the marriage course. And the idea is not the marriage course. The marriage course will give you the concept, the knowledge. But the whole thing is I walk with you. I walk through with you. The class that we walk. So I want to know you, you want to know me, and then I'll ask you, you can do the same. And I told them the marriage course, the marriage course I'm preparing for is for new couple who are getting married, or even single lady, a single man who have, have no 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 girlfriend, boyfriend, never mind, you can attend first so that you won't make the wrong mistakes. Uh, you, know, you come, you learn first. And those who are already married but have never gone through course, also attend. Those who are already only single mother, single father, never mind, you are old, old people, you are grandfather, grandmother, you attend as well. You say, why? Because you know how to teach your grandchildren and your children rightly. Don't say the wrong thing. Teach them wrong thing. So I want them. So many attend. Every time my marriage cost nearly a hundred people. And after a while, the, the Ipoh churches, I think they are very jealous indeed. The Mennonites, the Lutheran, the AOG, the Pentecostal, the every, every, everybody want to get married, send their people to me, to, to the course. Yeah. I say, I told them, I'm teaching you the course, you don't have to attend my church, but I'm teaching you the course. But uh, you say like that, uh, they will attend one. Uh, you say, go and attend, they will attend. Because I learned from it, you know, on the roadside, huh? you put a sign there, don't throw rubbish, people will throw rubbish. <laughs> so I say, don't come, <laughs> they come. <laughs> so, yeah, but, <laughs> So, I did the marriage course. My idea is to propagate one generation to the next generation. Grandmother, mother, father, everybody should teach your children. So, don't, don't say, cannot do this. The children ask, why? Pastor say, cannot. La. <laughs> Bible say, cannot. Huh? They, they won't take it. They won't accept it. Give them reasons, give them understanding. So, attend marriage course. So, I did that. And my Bible study course. So after that, people attending my, the, the basic course, they say, Pastor, what to do? So I say, okay, the next course is that you know, we have to do a Christian living course. I teach them Christian living, two years. I go, I don't have books, no. I just go to the bookshop and look through and adapt, you know, and Christian living. I teach them Christian living two years, two years. That time I don't have many churches yet at the beginning. And so I teach them two years. I told them, everybody, and I say, you take a notebook, write down everything I teach you, because next time you are the third to teach, and some laugh at me. So I teach two years Christian living. They call, what class is this? I don't know what class. I say, A class, class A. Okay. So they put class A. After two years, I say, we're going to do class B. What's class B? The first is Christian living, second is Christian service. No. So I say I have no time. I have services. Now my services have increased. So services. So I I will teach class B, but my class B people who attend my class B must teach class A. So I never gone back to class A. So the class B people, this week you, next week you, next week you, next week you. So I say you just use back the old notes, the, your, your notes that you have taken, you go and teach. So the class A group, new group, has every week different lecturer, different teacher, and class B attend my class. Then two years later, I went to class C. Now I'll tell you whether this is discipleship. So I went to class C. When I do class C, the class C teacher, class B, the class B, new class B teacher, new class A. And finally, when we came, then after the class C, the people say, hey, pastor, we read that, you know, Christian, Living Christian service and Kasi is Christian mission. So we really do all these same religion. What are next? Huh? Oh, next is theology class. Huh? So I started the theology class. I started the theology class and I asked the STM lecturer, I purposely, uh, the principal, purposely invite on Sunday. I say, you don't go back huh? after your service on Sunday and preach in my church. You stay Monday night. I want you to see. 
Wow, the principal saw my class. Huh? He says, Wow, you have more students than the STM. <laughs> because I got 80 over. Man. So STM to total three, year one, year two, year three, year four, only 70 at that time. So I got more. So I say, okay, now I'm teaching like SDM, you know, I need your accreditation. But I say, if you need accreditation, you need to follow our syllabus. I say, yes, and do your same, same assignment. And say, okay, we will do the same assignment. The first fruit, my wife, she was the first batch who graduated with many of the, of reverend and the priests, you know, graduated. Of course, she took a long time to graduate. So all you get, she took 18 years, one eight. Because in the middle, also got look at the baby and look at the children and all these things. You know? So then you stop for a while and then come back. So now, she already graduated. What year? Two zero one seven. she graduated, finally. It'll be the Bachelor of Theology. And I told, I, I did not only uh, disciple others, all my family are disciples. My wife, I say, must do, cannot not do, must do. Slow, never mind, must jalan. So, don't worry. Now, grandmother already, still serve. Don't worry lah, still serve. Because the cycle must go on. So, you must rub on in. Then when you rub, and the children saw my the mother, the father already serve, is serving as a pastor and a bishop. The, the children saw the mother, even though become mother, taking them to school, helping them with their uh, homework, all these things, and mother also studied. She didn't finish study and when I became a bishop. I became a bishop in 2007. So she didn't finish yet. So she had to travel back to Ipo, and she could have traveled to STM. Uh, some months easier, but because the whole gang is there, oh, so she travel back, take a bus back, take a train back, so, and the people appreciate, wow, Bishop Y also travel like that to study. The idea is, we want to impact them by showing our life. Even though you don't succeed, but you succeed to really impacting them. That's discipleship. Discipleship is impacting and transforming lives. In fact, discipleship is not the cost but it is the methodology that you carry on and teach them so that they can grasp it and they can run with it. So don't go so hard. Don't teach them all the theology and they cannot grab it. Just teach them something. And then after they teach, they improve. My mother told me when I was a little boy, one day my neighbor came and asked me to help them in their mess. I said no. My mother later on asked me, Boy, why you don't teach your classmate, neighbor? I say, if I teach him, uh, he'll be better than me. <laughs> I say, you know, like, young people those days, uh, better than me. You know, you get A, I don't get A, uh, better than me. So I don't teach. My mother told me this. I never forget. I think I don't know from four, uh, seven, four, seven, five, I don't know what this is. He says, son, if you know one plus one equals to two, you teach your friend, one plus one equals to two, you know two times. You have done your revision, but he only know one time. You teach one more person, one plus one equals to two, he also know one time, but you know three times. It's your revision. So discipleship, Jesus is actually saying, it's your revision. You teach someone, you know double, or no triple, and no more. So you keep teaching. And that's you grow and that's it. That's where the cycle will go on. The cycle, you keep teaching. Even though you, you may make mistakes, don't worry, but God will understand you because we are not all the professors of the college, you see. Right, next slide. We will, I will ask you a question, you can discuss later. <coughs> now I use your Project 111. If you understand the Project 111 that started once upon a time during Yong Ping Chung's days, and now we are repeating it. Very good, I like it. And I, I was asked in the Lambert call on the evangelism, I put this inside. I insist, that must go in. One, one, one. Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, is the charge of that. I said, no, no, we, 
We cannot just put a leper call with no direction. Put one, one, one. Pray for one person, accept Christ and disciple one person for one year. One, one, one. But you, you, you may have evangelized one person, lead him to Christ. Never mind, but it's a similar concept. So now the Anglican world, the, the leopard call on the evangelism has this one, one, one inside. Now my question asks is, no, you, you can discuss later. Uh, these are very crucial question I always ask. Who disciple you when you first accepted Christ or get baptized? Who disciple you? But I want to say to you, I went around the world to Africa, to Latin America, to America. Very sadly, very nobody, very small percentage has people disciple them when they first become Christian. Most of them don't have. And they will say, Pastor this. But Pastor didn't dis disciple you. The Pastor really preached teach you. He didn't disciple you by walking with you. So I say, who disciple you? So if you can answer yourself, they talk to the group, you share. Then the second question is, who is discipling you now? Then you say, oh, already senior, already you're discipling. No. The, the, when you go higher, your discipling is not, is not teaching anymore. Discipling is accountability. The discipling is that I can see you, sister. I really, I think, you no, know, you are going through some phase of challenges. Can we share? Let's pray for you. Why I, I went to Lambert? I could have stayed the whole two weeks there. Why I, I stay in the beginning and I said the end. The middle I disappeared. So because I'm doing what I need to do. I left, I went back to London and visited some of the old friends and I went to Lichfield and visit some of the old friends. I went to Liverpool and visit some of the old friends. The whole journey we, we travel that one week more than a thousand miles. We really travel more than a thousand miles. We travel up and down. And the people very appreciative. I went back and see some of these people because they impact my life. So I want to impact back them. Some of them really impact my life. One is a Navy captain. The Navy captain, he said he went to be a Navy, Navy, Navy officer. He parked in all the port and he can see a lot of young people lost. And then he went to park another port. He was a Navy captain. And I asked him, did you get involved in the Falkland Wars? He says that they ordered to go. But before they left, the boat was going on halfway. The war was ended because they were in another place. So he never got into. But anyway, the story, I want to visit him because he said, he shared with me, he really passionate with the gospel. He saw a lot of young people and he became, he started the project in St. Jack's volunteer group. And he, he, we shared and we journey together. Of course, now he's already in the 80s. So I go to visit him. I said, it is you who really, at that time, I saw you, you are 60 plus years, already retired from the Navy, and I saw you with passion. I say to myself, later on when I retire, I must keep the same passion, like you. I visited him. He was so touched that I visited him. Of course, now he used Tonka. Uh, then I visited my old lecturer in STM. He was a British man who came and started STM and as a founder at the beginning. And I, I, I went there and he taught me New Testament. Then I, I began to, I couldn't visit him. And he can't cancel the jaw. Cancel the jaw. The doctor removed half the jaw, bottom jaw, and put the shoulder bone, cut the shoulder bone, his shoulder bone, put here. Now it's like a, a ball like that. I said, do you need to go back? It's not only really clear, but it's, it's just ugly looking and like, with the ball here. But I can eat, I can do everything, talk. But talk with saliva workers, come up so we need more tissue to keep each up. But everything okay. No only chemo, everything. So I visited him, he's so happy because he says two years nobody came and visited us. And he is a lecturer. During his time in STM, he taught five of his students became bishop. He was so happy. Which lecturer can see five bishops from his class? Huh? Five lecture, five bishops from his class. So then I visited a few others because they are the ones who really 
touch my life, challenge my life in the early years of my Christian walk. So I say, I must touch it. This, now when you say, when you want to be discipling in the disciple world, you are, you, now you call mentor, or maybe you don't call mentor, you call counselor, counselee, or you may call directorship, or spiritual directing, but you just go and encourage. One word of encouragement will last you for a long time. We all, all need that. This is real discipleship. Not to put down, but to build up. Not to kill, but to plant. Not, not to destroy, but to release people into the ministry. So I want to say, now who are you discipling now? That's important. So today you should pray for one person to accept Christ and disciple this one person for one year. You should, every one of us. If you do that, whatever cost you have, that little book, the, the, the guide, like life guide, is also a good one. The life guide, they got 10 lessons. Use the life guide to encourage them. Don't go very fast to finish the course. Not intention is to finish the course fast, but the intention is to ask questions and to understand each other. Go on slowly, go on slowly, go on slowly. If you need to divide the two sessions, divide the two sessions so you have 20 classes. If you need to escape, uh, say for holiday, extend it. Never mind, take your time. You can do it within a half a year, more than a year. So the number four, can we target to disciple at least one person a year? Try. It can be your friend. It can be someone in the church who are really a Christian. Because then nobody has ever disciple them or walk with them. Just say, let's come for coffee. Can we talk and chat? Then maybe, are you interested? I told you, I end here by saying, when I was early young Christian, I was assigned someone to sign some someone assigned to me and walk with me for a year. And the second year, I myself went around and looked at all the seniors and I checked with the seniors and said, Brother, can I have Bible study with you? The brother was shocked because he was my senior. He was shocked. And so he said, I don't know much. I said, don't worry, let's learn together. So the second year, we do Bible study together. It was the second year Bible study. You know, I was only really one year plus a Christian. And it was the second year Bible study. We asked this question. He says, next time, I will graduate as an engineer. That person is the statistician. He will graduate. Then we, we ask ourselves, after studying God's word, you know, if God is so real, how can we serve him? Then we say, okay, we can, we will serve God. Then we challenge ourselves. Can we better that? Do better? Then we thought about it. Maybe we do part-time. Part-time work, part-time serve God. Then we ask ourselves again, in the Bible study, can we do much better? If it is so good and so real and it is really God and die for me? So finally we came to that point saying, no choice, go for that. If it is so real, go for that. That is my second year as a Christian, I really got that point. But I, I, I didn't commit myself until seven years later. But I really got that thought. That thought didn't, didn't go away and it keep floating in me and made me hungry. So the third year, I find another person and study again. And the fourth year, I took up the responsibility to, to disciple other, other people. And then, then I went back, came back to Malaysia to work and finally, to the SD. So that's my story. I want to say to you, it is possible, but you have to be intentional. Say to your neighbor, must be intentional. Yeah. Otherwise, you cannot tell us that. Yes, must be intentional. This cycle is intentional. And if you grow, and you will grow. Okay, I want to say thank you. In 1990, I came here and 
At that time, I came and I went to, at that time, Likas was uh, Reverend Simon. What is Simon? What? Chin. Chin. Simon Chin, yes. I stayed with him. And from there, I went into Tulupit, uh, went to Pilaha, uh, went to all these places. So, time no road. The road was really bad and, uh, you know, the van that we go in, they carry the chicken, carry all the vegetables, carry all sorts of things. And we don't have place to put our bag and our leg was squashed up. And by the time we reached, uh, run out, and then we changed another van, we go in. So those were the days, 1990. And I, I was very excited. I say, uh, must go and see the, the indigenous people of Sabah. So I brought a team of people, young people there. I was the youth chair of the diocese. So I went there I went and saw Fred David there. Then I and went into the Binangado after the break. You know, the car, the van don't move like that, or no, move like that. No. <laughs> so those were the days. I went back and I asked God. I, every time when I do all these things, I will ask God, God, what is this? Why, why do you show me this? God never say anything. Quiet. When God is quiet, then be, be careful. Huh? <laughs> when God is quiet, be, be careful. <laughs> so, then one day, you know, the burden came. Indigenous, indigenous, indigenous. Then it dawned on me, when I was in STM doing my final year a thesis, I did on the Chinese villages during the OMF days. And on the same year, because I was a youth chair of the diocese and I joined CCM, CCM sent me to India to see the, the, the squatters of India. And asked God, why are these three things? The indigenous in Sabah, you know, the Chinese villages in West Malaysia and India, the, the colonies, the squatters. It just, one morning in my devotion, we just came together and God said, I want you to do village work. I was in the city. I grew up in the city. I never grew up in the village. So I had no idea of the villages. So I was so burdened. I don't know what to do. No books, no leaders, no money, no machinery. What to do? Go on, what to do? So I began to share with many of the priests and the pastors. And everybody just laughed. And one person even laughed at me and said, You have nothing to do. Uh. One church in Ipo enough to do, why you want to worry about all those things? But the, the, the burden came. So I wrote a paper to the bishop that I want to do village work. And I told very blankly that I have no money, no, no, no books, no methodology, no strategy, no nothing. But I felt burdened to do. And the bishop took it and said, very good. But then he said very good and then he said nothing for six months. Then you worry. <laughs> six months later he said, I think you should start. And I said, I want to, I don't know what to do. But he said, you just start, let God lead you. And that is where in 1993, I started and with nothing, I went ahead and start. You ask me how, I really don't know. But I started, I tell you, one Methodist pastor told me, he says, Brother, this time of asking work, huh? you want to start, I give you one year. Huh? At our 10th anniversary, I invited him. I'm tapping you, oh, you can last 10 years. Huh? <laughs> Next year is 30 years. 2023. 1993, next year 30 years. And I started, I always, as a person, I planned for 30 years and beyond. I told myself, when I start there, I don't know anything. If the one who was born today, 30 years time, I must touch him, his life. So he has 30 years to touch him. But if any adults come in, to me is bonus. I will take it as bonus. So now you ask me, how do I do discipleship? It literally, I do the, exactly the same the British missionary who came. I brought kindergarten and schools to them. I brought clinics to them. And I brought social work to them. I teach them how to rear goats, chicken, uh, uh, duck, uh, plant, crops, paddy, everything. 
So I don't know how to do. I'm an engineer. I don't know how to do that. I invite people to come and teach them, even rare fish. But I want to end by saying this one thing. You know, when we first started the goat farm, we sent this man. We went to village and see who we can trust. One man, we pick him and then send him to the government goat farm. Learn one week, come back. You know, you know what to eat, what type of leaves, what type of thing to feed people. So we got a place in his kampong. We, we are so excited. We buy ten goats for him. After one month, nine goats only. Mana itu? Tata. Another month later, eight goats only. Mengapa lapar saja? Tata. Until seven, Tata. Six, Tata. More worry, really lah. Oh yo, I so worry yo. So we all discuss what to do, ah. So we took away from him, you know, took away. At that time, we had five female goats and five male goats. He said, took away. Then I said, we move to another kampong. Don't give, don't give him lah. Every time we talk, talk, talk. So we all talk to each other. I said, don't know whether they talk, pour into the curry tau, no? Curry tau is pot, the pot lah. Maybe it's a curry pot. So we we took to another another village. I tell you, they were very good. Within one year, we got thirty-two goats. So that we we begin. Then later on, we expand fish pond and all these things. So literally, we I did exactly the three missionary, three four missionary method, and to help them. And at the same time, we teach the adults and teach the children uh, both the Bible and the, uh, all the things that we that we we need. Now I'm very happy because. Uh, We have the first Oran Asli who get a degree in theology because the Oran Asli, the Methodists have been doing it since 1930s. No one has ever got a degree, and they only get a diploma. Because now we we but we we did not have one. Then we we have four, and now six more are on the ordination list. Uh, another six are coming up for degree. Uh, we teach them. We go through and help them. So it is a long process, but I would say it worthwhile. Now I now what the the CMS always talk about the threefold ministry or the China threefold ministry. They say that must self propagate, self govern, and self finance. We already help them. They can self propagate. Now they are reaching the kampung themselves. No need us. You know they are reaching. And Bishop Stephen Abraham, my successor bishop. Is trying to make a deanery among them because there are too many kampongs already now. Uh, secondly, uh, they self first is their they are self uh, propagating, they are self governing. Now they have, they have so many priests and they are running their own. We we are only offering help, just advice and help. And now the third area we are working on self financing. I have a one project which was not realized, which I bought a two acre land. I want to make. A vocational center for them, but then MCO came, everything stalled. So now Bishop Stephen Abraham asked me to go sit near there to oversee the project, make sure the vocational center come up. So now he's already entered to the government uh, municipality and waiting for it to come up. And I, 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 I really, when I was a bishop, I planned that I set aside money for this vocational center. So I wanted to teach them so that they. Were able to do some vocations on their own, like electrical wiring, plumbing, and motor repair. Because they got a lot of motors, they say motor repair. So we are getting people to help them the vocational center, training them, so they can able to go and do it themselves. No need to go every time and ask other people to help them, and so they can also earn by themselves. So we we are helping them. We we know that now the farming, a lot of youngsters are actually not interested in farming. So when you say how successful it is, I would consider successful because thirty years, my vision is actually they they are really nearly there. And secondly, the young the young people, the thirty years old, they have, so many of them. Last time I saw the little children, now they are running the show. And music is number one in them though. They are being built. They don't even learn music. They don't learn from from each other. They take out a guitar, they jam. They take out a drum, they can jam. We all have to learn from school. They don't have to. This is one thing very good in them. 
And the only thing is that we have to shape them, the mindset. And now they are learning to give tithing. Very good. No, money-wise, they are looking after itself. But except that they cannot afford to pay the, 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 the salary of the worker yet. So we are helping. So I want to say this is number one question. Do you have a question? Ah, this is the question. Uh, and I think my discipleship concept is not only teaching the word. My discipleship concept is to transform the communities. That's the discipleship. Transform the person. Or you can say role modeling for them. So that's number one. Number two question. Uh, question two. Uh, to assist parish and churches to actually apply practice discipleship over a continuous period of time, how do we sustain the passion and the commitment when if there is challenges and difficulties being experienced by the rector and his leaders? Uh, I want to say to you, uh, I don't have an answer for this question, but the priests that are under me, and I always encourage them and say, my dear, dear brothers, commit yourself even though you have five years or seven years in one parish, commit yourself to teach them. And first teach the leaders. And then from the leader, let the leader teach the others. If you have time, you can teach others. I know that the, our parishioners are there. If the pastor is here, everybody talk to the pastor and teach. And the leaders, nobody will learn from them. So you have to let go. Like I say, class A, class B, let go. You teach the class B, class A, B will teach the class A. You, you have to let go. Let the leaders teach them. Even though they may not teach as good as you are, never mind. They are bonding is there. And role model is there. The accountability is there. You have to let go. All the masters must let go. Teach the first group and let them teach. And then you pick another group and you teach them, let them teach the rest. You have to do that. Jesus did three years and he deliberately had to travel to heaven. The disciples don't know what to do. What happened? Now, finally, when the call comes, Peter rise up to preach. And he was so surprised. 3,000 came on the first day. You think Peter ever dreamed, dreamt that he would get 3,000 people believe him and baptize And then after that, day by day, so, they can, we can trust it, because it is not our job, it's God's kingdom, God's job. So I want to say, the second question here is, uh, keep doing it, even though you plan yourself three years, five years, you, if three years you plan yourself, do three groups, and let the three groups do their work. So you say you are not a pastor, never mind. You know a pastor you can do two people or one people or five people. You just do your own self-group. And make sure you teach them and let them run the show. And tell yourself, excuse yourself, lah. go holiday. I cannot come back, no. Uh, you do <laughs> Excuse lah. You have to do like that. They will rise up to the occasion. Uh, so now you know lah, why people all take leave. Huh? Okay, yeah. <laughs> So, number three, you have helped to build quickly churches, church plus, how do you do that? Uh, again, I, I don't have an answer because my heart is full of discipleship and church planting. And that's why now the Anglican world make me the, the, the chair. Because every time I share, they all say, wow, this experience. And I, I, not only that I have track record experience, but the, the, the contribution I gave, they, sound, they found that it's really sound and wise words. So I started in 1993. I asked the church that I want to build, I plant a church. Uh, and I told you about the light, the, the light moving to a new place. My PCC, I tell you, I have to, at the beginning, very hard with the PCC. The PCC cannot buy my concept. And the PCC will say, always say, our church is not big enough. So let us consolidate first. I say we should consolidate as well as plan. So finally the church didn't agree. Didn't agree. 
So church didn't agree. So I said, okay, uh, I will help the church to consolidate. Can you give me a leeway that I will take a few people to do? Not from the church. The church cannot say no. La. Finally, I took a few people and I start. Christ church people were started like that. I went into a I, I earmarked the place and I studied the, the demograph and I see how many church members there were 12 families there. But I want to tell you in the end of the day, the 10 families didn't want to stay in the new church. They all went back to the mother church. They liked the mother church. Only two families. So two families, they stay there. Oh, you know Dr. Philip Lin, isn't it? One of Philip Lin's uh, uh, uncle was there. The Lin family. I used his house and do in 1993. So I started in a house meeting. Now the house meeting then we gathered there uh, for six months, then we became a church. Big enough, we rented a place. And the church was very reluctant. I say, I told the people, we, we will raise funds ourselves, don't get church funds. But after building one church, I built a second church. The church half opened up already. No, after the second church, the church opened up already. Let's just open up. Say, let's run together. Now the church is very happy because I've been running with them and they're running with me. So it, it began. So how do I begin? Mm -hmm. I want to say to you, it's not an easy thing because every center is different style. And I, I'm very conscious because I'm a build, bridge builder. When I was building bridges those days, the JKR has the same model, do everything same, all the bridges are the same plan. But when you go to the ground, the ground are different. Some ground need piling, some ground need drilling, some ground need big cast concrete, some ground has stones and rocks and you, 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 have, you have to anchor it. So it's all different. So I knew the church, all the church are different. So some I started with tuition, some I started in a house, and some I started with social work, and some I started with just a community work. So I, I, I can say a range, but today I just share with you. So I try all these things, uh, and it somehow work. If it doesn't work, I'll adapt it and change it. And you have work, and then the biggest thing is not to start a church. The biggest thing is to train the people. That's the biggest thing. How to get people. The bishop all oh, every day call me. Burning, I got anyone sent to the seminary or not? I said, wait now, wait now, wait. Then I train and send and never come back. Train, send, never come back. All the time disappear. So I never mind. I told the bishop, never mind. Take, take. And I never make him angry. He's very happy with me. So I take, take. So finally, I train all these people who sent out, but even then, I still have 40 over people to look after the 50 churches when I left as a bishop. After I left the church, that St. Peter's, for four years, I make sure there's no rector, there's no vicar, there's no priest there. So all run by lay people, only the retired people do, priests do the communion. Four years, I wanted to test, see whether the church can still last or not. For four years, no priest. Then I put a priest. Back after the, the fifth year, I put back a priest. So four years, I look at it. Hey, boleh lah. They can run and the church can grow and the money is still there. You know, even in the COVID, so surprisingly, so nobody come to church. The people still send money to the church. And, and the account, when I went back, they showed me the account. Hey, we got surplus lah. COVID also got surplus. Praise the Lord. Huh? So that means the people have really entered into their minds already. Now the, now the new priest who there, he asked me, he said, what should I do uh, in this church? You you are you are here 20 years. I say, that's what I shared with you just now. I said you should do that. Teach them, but release them to teach others. Just you need to see three to five years, you will see a result. You need three to five years. You need a few rounds, you can see the result. I, always, I want to say to you, you guarantee you will see the result. Because Jesus did three years with the disciple and they will see the result. Try, it will. And give yourself a chance. Number four, 
Hey, your phone is different from my phone. Huh? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Oh, that one must be big. How much discipleship is in the heart and how much is tied to physical discipline and fasting? Uh, okay, I wanted to say to you, discipleship and spiritual formation is, looks at two different things, but they are tied together. Now, I, after I retired, Bishop Stephen Abraham, I, I, when, I, when I was a bishop, I really introduced spiritual formation for all the, the diocese. Anyone want to do? Uh, Samuel, you, you did it, did you? Or you, you escaped with here? Or you escaped with it? <laughs> you only knew the MICPE, right? I escaped. Okay, I, I introduced, because I, I see that in order to shape a worker, not only theological knowledge, of course, that one they need. Definitely they need theological knowledge. So they go to the Bible school, you can afford it. But then when you come and serve, you need to hear from God. Everybody cannot hear from God. Why cannot hear from God? So we, my spiritual formation, I'm, I'm director of spiritual formation. My wife is in charge of the Chinese section of spiritual formation. I'm in charge overall, the Tamil, the BM, the Chinese, English, everything. So the spiritual formation, I, I'm very clear that we need to hear God speak to us or from us and repress us, but we cannot hear. So we learn spiritual formation, we learn silence how to hear from God, but we can, we are very scared, we are scared of silence. Hey, but silence, we put on the radio, we put on everything. So, we learn silence, we learn to hear from God when we are very noisy. We learn to hear from God from nature, we learn to hear from God from the scripture, we learn to hear from God when when we are on recreation. We, we, we have to intentionally learn to hear. That's pretty good information. They walk us. Either you do fasting, these fastings and all these things, let you divina, fastings, meditation, these are methodology to help you, but you have to learn the process how to intentionally hear from God. And every time I say God impress me, you, 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 it's possible, but the Bible is talking, you know, Abraham heard, David heard, Paul heard, everybody heard. How come we, we don't hear? So we intentionally learn to hear. So that's how I, 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 I am spiritual formation. I felt that's the, the discipline must be there. So when you have the discipline, there's a discipline for the spiritual formation, and then there will be the discipline for the discipleship. When these two merge together, you can be the man of God, the woman of God. You can be that one. And people can see when you pass by, they can sense the aroma that come from you. They will know because these two must come together. Not only fasting, fasting is one of the many things. Uh, that is, that's why I, I developed this uh, before I retired. So now the bishop asked me, since you develop it, you take up the charge. Huh? So I'm now I'm taking charge. But I say give me two years, huh? you better find new people. Huh? But I, I'm also watching to find people for you. The, Question five is or question four is a question four is a question four question five now. You share that you have started many churches and you did not ask them, bishop or any worker, but race leaders among the group. May I know how this is done and and is deep uh, done? Uh, you ask a group of church members to go away and meet separately in different premises. Who conduct holy communion in a new church? Um, you have to adapt the situation. Uh, I actually didn't ask the bishop. Uh, for a worker, I didn't because the bishop every time called me, ask for workers for the diocese. So how can I ask for him? He doesn't even have. So I sent to him and say, you take, bishop, you take, you take, you take. So but I, I I keep grooming, I keep grooming. So I didn't ask for bishop, and the bishop at that time when I took over the diocese, the diocese is in the red, half a million in the red. So I know that, that the bishop has no money, so I never ask for one cent from the bishop. All the churches that I develop, I try to build the church so that they don't have to rent and the offering goes to the rent. So I want to save the offering for the ministry. So I build for them. And until one point, one of the archdeacons in the Sunday committee said, another building! Hey, I 
at that time I was Ashtikan. Ashtikan Mone, how many buildings you buy already? And then I'm building. Almost every year, one building I buy. Every year, one building I buy. And I, people ask me, how you raise a fund? I tell you, I don't know. Literally, I trusted God and I believe Hudson Taylor said this. Hudson Taylor in his book, and I read it when I was a young Christian. He said, if you do God's work, God's way, God will provide. But I want to add, if you do God's work, God's way, in God's time, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. Really, literally, no, don't worry. I bought so many buildings. I just raised the fund and asked the people, you know, we are doing this job. The people just sent in money and come in and build. All the very good churches. Shakina, Mama, they want bought. Agape, I couldn't bought. Uh, uh, Coast Street, it's Carrie's Church in Coast Street, bought. Everywhere, you know, on Asli and Hallelujah Church, bought. Christ Church, bought. And some bought two buildings because the church need to go bigger. And, and, and uh, uh, Cornerstone, we bought. Ray of Hope, we bought. So we bought so many buildings until the church we said, how can so many buildings you buy? It's only for one church. I didn't ask money from the diocese. And the bishop knew because every time he comes and open one. <laughs> I make sure he open. Oh, then he got desecrated by the bishop or oh, consecrated by the bishop. Oh, happy. So he knew, he knew he hit me. Ah, I can do the thing. Then I, I do not. I, I want to say that I did not really go and knock at the door and ask people for money. You just pray to God, you trust God, He will drop money. I have people who send me money, 100,000, 200,000, 1 million into my table. He says, do what you want to do. I want to say to you literally, do what you like to do. Because they heard your name and they trusted you, so you just do. So this, this, this story I can only say to you, how I started, you just, in the end of the day, the God wants a disciple. You allow God to live in you and you obey Him, walk that journey. Trust, like Hassan Caleb, He will work. I was thinking, reading Hassan Caleb, I said, how can, how can this guy do it? I can do it. So I had already gone through. And the communion part, at those churches, we, we don't have communion. So we just have to, to ask them to make do without communion. Some of the ugly places, I cannot reach them. Sometimes in three months, only have one communion. So I invited other priests to come and visit, and then they'll take communion there. We wait for the bishop to do confirmation. And so my bishop, the, the one with my predecessor bishop, he didn't like to go to the Asli place. So I asked him to do confirmation. He asked him, come out, come out, come out and do confirmation. So, but I would like to go into them and do confirmation with them. So make them feel happy that they are wanted, they are important, that you visit them. But since the bishop said, come out, so we also bring them out, out uh, to, to do confirmation during his time. But during my time, I went in and do confirmation for them. Just like when we go to Nepal, uh, uh, Cambodia, mm -hmm. Indonesia, we do confirmation for them. But of course now, uh, when I became a bishop, I realized this is the problem. So I allow lay people to take reserve communion to them. So the lay reader, so we allocated the lay reader. Okay. We are already assigned that you are going to the, to the our Asli place to, to take communion there. We, we have this special container to take you and you just, and whatever you have, finish it. But I want to tell them this, not magic, no magic, no, no, something come up, nothing. Just a communion because we want to follow the Anglican style. The priest was consecrated in the church, just keep aside, finish it that day. No, no, keep it. So now the lay people are doing it. Uh, any more? No more questions? Eh? Sudah? Oh, Sudah? Eh? Any more? Uh, 
question to us. We still have uh, five minutes. One question. Anybody? You can use the mic here. Anybody want to ask uh, one final question? Oh, yes, okay. please, please. Uh, on the radio. Uh, one question nowadays we are in the what, uh, modern tech, all this sort of thing. And uh, everybody is concentrating on the next gen. So, what do you think of this? How to disciple the next gen or, or the millennium? Uh, okay. Uh, the, those who are born in the 80s, 90s, they are called Generation Y. They are born in the 2000s, they are called. Uh, 90s to 2000, they are called Generation Z or Z. Now those who are born later is called an Alpha Generation. Now it's new. the new generation is called Alpha Generation. Those who are born uh, later of 2000, before 2010 onwards. Okay. So they are coming up. I want to say to you, our churches around the world are very slow. At one stage, we were ahead. The music, look at the music, the church was ahead those days, before the world took over. And everybody was looking at all the Mozart and all the church music, those was ahead. Arts, the church was ahead before the world took over. You know, science, the church was ahead before the world took over. So when the church closed up in the dark ages, the world takes over. So now music we lost to the world, arts we lost to the world, and science we lost to the world. And now we even come to the question, we, you know, science and church compete, you know, is it relevant to each other or not? So we have this problem. So we need to revive. We need to revive. Actually, the COVID has set a time for us. The COVID has set a time for us. You must understand God is shaking the church and the church not moving God said get out of the church the church still stay inside the, the four walls God said get out why? when the internet 1G the church didn't move 2G didn't move 3G didn't move 4G didn't move until you got put COVID suddenly all of us into the internet already wow we zoom here zoom there everything zoom really. so now 5G we already know God said I'm doing something to kick you out now now the church is advanced already and second thing that God put the church in the COVID days you know we got so many live video the YouTube everything we bombard the whole internet world the, the Facebook we bombard all the YouTube everything in all the languages we bombard now the Muslims are not doing it, the Hindus are not doing it, the Buddhists are not doing it. So if you want anything, you click, it's all Christian talk, Christian sharing. So we are bombarding the world. Otherwise, all the scam and all the pornography will be up there. But don't stop. Because the next generation is already up there. You like it or not? So that's our high tech. So of course, when you say, we, we still look after the senior generation, but we must also look after the new generation. The new generation is not only high tech. They came to the point, the new generation, high tech is one thing, their mindset changed. When the Y generation, they call Y generation because they ask why this happened, why this happened, why this happened, they call why. And Z generation, they have no more absolute of truth. The truth is depending on them because we never study them. And now, that's why the young children look, challenge the parents. Why do you think it's correct? You know, why at night I cannot clip, clip my fingernails? Uh, why I cannot do this? Why I cannot do this? So, now we don't know how to answer them. We just, those days we just accept, accept. But now this question, no absolute truth. I, if you can do it with your God, I can do it without my God. They will challenge you. This generation have moved there. So when we understand them, then you will, the second thing you have to study, what type of interest are they going for? And thirdly, what type of things attract them? The church is not doing that. It's why we lose all of these people. 
I, July, I started the church only for young people. Of course, we don't call young people church, lah, because one day they get old. But I started the church for young people. So the whole setup, the whole way of doing things is catered for young people. All catered. I, and they say, hey, you are retired now, old, old man, you know. But how come you get old man can think like a young man? I say, you just have to look, study the demographic and move on. So I want to say to the, the church is, now the church in England or in the world, you know, if you depend on the traditional church, the church is dwindling less and less people. But the church is also growing, especially the Diocese of London, is growing very fast. The Diocese of London every year grows 17%. Whereas the whole of England is reducing. Why? I'm a church planter together with the, the Bishop Rick Throat, who is the church planter for the Church of England. So when we study that, it's because he it says, number one, I feel just very quickly, the mother church, the existing church, must turn, change their mindset to become a resource church. I will qualify the data. You don't do church, you do resource church. That means you provide resources. You churn up resources, like discipleship. Churn up, train up, resource church. You provide, 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 resource church. Money, you provide. People, you provide. Services, you provide. Facilities, you provide. You know, transportation, you provide. Administration, you provide. So provide a resource church, you become a resource church. Then, you will reach out to the new group of people who are out in the field, using their understanding and their style and reach them. They call them fresh expression. You type in the Google fresh expression. There are four thousand over churches fresh expression now. And you type messy church. They are touching the alpha generation messy church. They are young. It's like Sunday school, but they develop differently from Sunday school. So both churches fresh expression and messages. They don't have building, they use building anywhere they like. You can use your existing building or somewhere else to messages and fresh expression church. They are doing it so that they can tackle many congregations. And now these are spreading out into America, Latin America, in Africa, and Australia, New Zealand. But Asia, we have not catch up any of this kind yet. I've been telling the people, fresh expression, they don't call church because the word church the mindset block, so they call fresh expression. Fresh expression don't have one style. The style are catered for the people on the on the ground, and all these are young. And then messages catered for the alpha generation. The alpha generation. We we are still very old mindset lah, but old mindset never mind because it's suitable for you man. But then you have to change your mindset to be a resource you provide and support for them. And once they are ready, they will start. So, my ending, I just want to say to you, I'm sure you heard about HTBB in KL. HTBB. When I came back from Australia, I was converted in Australia. I never become a Christian here. I was become a Christian. So I find it very hard to adapt to the local church, set up different. We, uh, earlier when we were thinking about the communion, one cup, and then the last time we had a small little cup. You know? Last time we sit down there, people serve us. Now we had to go up there and think, and then drink the same cup, but you also drink, you also drink, you also drink. Oh, takut lah, takut lah. Those days lah, those days. So I never get used to it, you know. So I always say, and then I look at my friends, uh, half of them who came back, went back to Australia within three years and never come back, migrated. I say I wanted to start a church to cater for the returnees, overseas returnees. Then I started twice, but in Ipoh, no returnees very much, mostly in KL. So it, it didn't succeed. I didn't give up, it didn't succeed. So when I became a bishop, I say I must start. I pray about it, waiting for the right time. Then in 2010, I, did, I, I met him. Dicky Campbell. I knew him earlier. Uh, so I talked to him. He, he wanted to have an alpha 
heart and I wanted to have a church. So we talked, then he said, okay, let's pray about it. 2011, he said, do you have a church in KL that I can convert into Alpha Church? I look at the list, da bole la. How to convert the mindset, of da bole la. So I said, in 2012, I said, let's start a new. He said, okay, let's start a new. So then we plan for that, HDBB. So the long story cut, 2014, September, we started. Uh, then 2015, we have another service. 2016, we have the third service. Then 2017, we have the fourth service. You know, we keep having it. Now we have five services there, not including the Myanmar service. So if you include Myanmar service, it's six services. Uh, the church keep expanding. And the second year, I already planted. I want. I already plan to have a Saint Paul's Theological College. He said, "Go oh, STM, but did want to start another one?" STM was really angry with me, but I was the president of STM, so they cannot say anything, lah. Huh? <laughs> At that time, I'm the president, so they cannot say. I say, "These are the people I want to have. Are the people who are in the homes? They cannot go full time. They got family. Not everybody can go full time. <coughs> this like ATI." You know, you don't have to go full time. So I want to do the mixed mode stuff. So we went through that, and now they have already graduated three batches of people already. Each batch of 30, 30 graduate, more than STM. Lah. But, I'm, but I am but will still encourage STM because also a full time goal. But these ones are part timer. They do part time night course and do part time. So my idea is to be churn out. Tap them where they are. So they are the people who cannot give up their job, they want to serve, but you cannot let them serve. And these people can give up the job, let them serve, but this one cannot give up the job, they want to serve. So I want to say, so I tap that for that generation, that is the Y and Z generation that I tap in now. So we are, we are really telling them, now we are, trying to study and revising to tap the alpha generation. Now they are still the teens, they are the teens. We will need to tap the alpha generation. So you need to study what they are doing it. A lot of books are there in the market, in Google you tap alpha generation, they can see a lot of things. Study them, but you have to parallelly study them and want to start parallelly, your church needs to have the mindset to be a resource church. Type in resources, there are books of resources teach you how to be resources. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, it's there. But you want to engage with me later, you can engage with me, I can tell you more. Uh, because we are, I'm not going to tell you this thing. I'm going into the provinces. We are invited into the different provinces to go and help them to understand the same thing. With two or three days seminar uh, to help the provinces to change their mindset. We are not doing the job for them. We just encourage them. You know, there are materials here. There are people who are expert here. Speak to this, speak to that, and try to come up with a dynamic model that you have for your own. Okay, thank you.